So, um, welcome to the Scandal Week 5. Um, I'm excited. We have been flowing through through this series fairly quickly. Um, and how many know, again, I'll, I'll kind of go back from, from week one where I talked about, you know, calling this to scandal is not just, is not just clickbait. It's not, it's not just scandalous to call this the scandal, but Paul used those very words um, when he described what the gospel is, that it is, it is a scandalon in the Greek. It's the word that we use to translate today into scandal. It is scandalous. It makes no sense. It violates common sense. It violates everything man thought about who the Messiah would be, how he would show up, what he would do, what he would look like. Because really, really what people think of when they think of God is just a better version of themselves. God values what I value, but he does a better job of doing it than, than me. In fact, here, here's something that, that you'll find very interesting and very sad. Okay, So um, many people in this country do claim to be Christian, but an independent study was done in polling many of the Christians in the churches across the United States to ask them what they believe on just some basic principles. And here's what they concluded. Many of the people in this nation who claim to be Christian are actually what is considered to be therapeutic deists. Are you familiar with the term? Good, because I just made it up. Just kidding, that's not true. Uh, look it up. <laughs> that Although they claim to be followers of Jesus, church-attending, God-loving, God-fearing people, the practical outlay of their faith and how they live and what their expectations are is what's called therapeutic deism. So you're familiar with deism? Deism is the belief that there is a God, but that God has a laissez-faire approach to the ordeal of man, right? God created, God spoke everything into existence, but God does not intervene in, in the world. That's, that's the belief of deism. Therapeutic deism, and unfortunately what many Christians in churches across our country believe is this. God just wants me to be happy. So he's not, he's not here to judge me right? He's not here to, to make me better. He's not here to correct sin in my life. God's ultimate goal is for me to be happy. And so he intervenes in my life if, oh no, I didn't study for that test. I think I'm going to fail. So tonight I'm going to pray really hard and God's going to intervene by making sure I get an A even though I didn't do any of the work to study. Right? I, I did something stupid, and now there's, there's natural consequences to my decision, but I'm going to pray, and God's going to alter those natural consequences in order to make me happy. But other than that, God has nothing to say about the fact that I'm living in sin and I don't care. Well, I'm imperfect. Everybody's imperfect. Well, guess what? There's going to be imperfect people in heaven, and there's going to be imperfect people in hell. There was a significant difference among imperfect people. You know what that difference is? Repentance. That's a difference. The difference is repentance. It's what Christ did on the cross, open the door for you, right? But look, and I know, I know we grew up in the church where it's like, well, believe in Jesus and that makes you a Christian. Well, by your definition then, Satan is a Christian. It's not just believing that Jesus exists, right? It's repent of your sins. That's why John the Baptist, when he showed up to prepare the way for the Lord, it was repent, prepare for him. For who? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So how do we know if the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to your life? It means your heart has been changed from one of stone to one of flesh, and you are therefore repentant. With me? I know, I'm just opening in, like, I didn't even ease in today. I just kind of went, went for it, right? But it's important that we get this. It's important that we get this. Because the very gospel is a scandal. Look at world religions. Look at world religions. And, and dare I even say the, the religious views of Christianity too. If I pray this prayer, if I do this, if I act this way, I can manipulate God into doing what I want him to do. That's religion. That's religion. What Christianity at its very core is, is that God absolutely is head over heels in love with you. You don't have to twist a thing to get him to love you. 
you know, moms, moms and dads, right? You ever play the game with your kids and you go, how much do I love you? I love you this much. Oh, I love you this much. I love you, right? Well, Jesus got on a cross and said, I love you this much. That you didn't have to do a thing for. Not a thing. How we know that you have actually believed on, believed in, put your faith, your hope, your life in Jesus Christ is that your heart has changed. The person who says, well, I can sin however I want, do whatever I want because Jesus died on the cross for me is a person who has not actually received and understood what Jesus Christ did on the cross for them. And therefore, I would argue that it's not for them because they have not yet actually received it. The blood of Jesus Christ is not a buffet that we take what we want and leave what we don't. It is an all-inclusive package. And as we accept him, our heart is changed. And we naturally find ourselves being what Martin Luther described. Every Christian is living simply a life of constant repentance. Of turning away from sin. Of self-evaluation. As an act of worship, as I say, God, your holiness is more important than my happiness. Your righteousness, what you did for me, is more important than me just swiping uh just sweeping sin under the carpet amen Amen. so welcome to week five of the scandal today's uh message is called a party continues a party continues jesus performed many miracles during his three and a half years of ministry that we see throughout the gospels jesus did things like heal sick people it's pretty cool right no? You don't think that's cool? Amen. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's, that's pretty cool, I think, right? Mm-hmm. I, I would have loved to have been part of his entourage, you know? Like, you just walk into town, there's like sick people, and all of a sudden, they're not sick anymore. That's pretty epic. I mean, I, I feel like it's, it's probably pretty easy to draw a crowd if, like, every time you walk into town, sick people are healthy, right? I mean, you, you don't got to do much marketing for that. You don't need any SEO. You don't got to be on page one of Google for that. Like, it's just... Right? People, people are going to find that out real fast. Blind people were able to see. Like, how cool is that? And some of these people were born blind. Like, just let that sink in. Imagine, imagine you were born blind. You, you have never actually seen anything. And all of a sudden, Jesus opened your eyes and for the first time, you're now, you're now seeing things. Like, you don't even know how to describe Like you've sat in chairs and you have felt chairs, but you've never seen one, right? You've, you've, you've talked to the people you love. You've held their hands. You've embraced them and hugged them. But now for the first time, you're seeing what they look like. Hopefully you're not disappointed. <laughs> Come on, give me something, guys. Uh, you know, and, and so just imagine that. That, that's who Jesus was. Check it out. Paralyzed people were able to walk. Could you imagine that? Your, your whole life, you've had to rely on somebody else to ambulate anywhere and everywhere. You can't even do something as simple as putting a K-cup in a machine and making your own cup of coffee. Somebody else has to do everything for you. And Jesus shows up and suddenly you are Mr. or Mrs. Independent. Isn't that, isn't that insane? Right? The things that we take for granted each and every day that, that these people lacked until Jesus showed up in their lives. Or how about this one? Imagine, imagine being a parent and having to bury your own child. Doesn't something feel wrong about that? Like, my goal for my kids is that they bury me. I, I, can't, I can't wrap my mind. And, and, and I know people personally who have endured this, this rare and deep level of pain. Imagine you're coming to terms with that. You're broken. Maybe you're still in shock. You're grieving. Your heart is destroyed because sickness took your little baby girl. All the dreams and hopes and aspirations you had for her, gone as you bury your child. 
until Jesus comes to town and tells her to get back up. And then has the audacity, and then has the audacity to say, she's probably hungry, give her something to eat, and walks away. <laughs> God, man. <laughs> Jesus is legendary. Like, that's just awesome. That's who, who he was. I wish I got to be part of that entourage. Well, there are 37 miracles that are detailed in the Gospels that Jesus performed. 37. How many? 37. Awesome. Just making sure everybody's awake. Okay, cool. But we know much more than this happened for multiple reasons, right? There, there's times where, where it says that Jesus showed up in town and there was basically just a line of people. And sometimes it says, and all of them were healed that day. And sometimes it says, and most. But a good chunk of time it says, and all. So we know a lot more than just 37 miracles took place. But check this out. It's even further than that. Because John, John ends the gospel of John this way. In John chapter 21, verses 24 and 25, it'll be on the screen for you. John writes, this is the disciple who testifies to these things, so he saw them firsthand, and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if every one of them were written down, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. You know how long John spent with Jesus? Come on, I know you know this answer. Hit me. Come on, man. Why are you giving her the answer? I'm just kidding. Yeah, three and a half years. Could you imagine? I got to tell you guys. If you said, hey, Vin, I am going to, to leave home and I'm going to follow you 24-7 for three and a half years. I promise you will be very bored. You will be very, very bored. I am not that impressive. What Jesus did in three and a half years, in three and a half years, the world itself would not be able to contain all the books. Now, obviously, John is using a little bit of hyperbole there, but understand the point he's trying to articulate. There was a lot more than 37 miracles. Wherever Jesus showed up, things got disrupted. Crazy. Crazy cool. And when you think about the three and a half years that the disciples spent with him, that every single day was this roller coaster ride, you got to wonder how on earth did they doubt when he was crucified? Like, it's not even like he didn't give them a heads up. Like he said beforehand, right? Hey, I'm going to be crucified. In fact, in fact, you want to be my servant? Take up your cross and follow me. Like, as Christians who are reading our Bible 2,000 years after all of this, we can forget that Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me before he was crucified, <laughs> right? So the disciples are like, what? Hashtag awkward, bro. What are you talking about, right? But Jesus talked about this before he was crucified. Then he's crucified and resurrected. And they're like, oh no, I didn't see that coming. He's like, I kind of told you. In fact, I gave you the date. I said three days. I, I, I told you. <laughs> Spoiler alert. And yet they were shocked. Isn't that us? Isn't that us? Like Jesus does these incredible things and we have these incredible moments and, and you know, I, 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 call it, I call it the Monday morning hangover, right? Like Sunday, we get this like, we're energized and yeah, Jesus can do that and yeah, everything's gonna be good and then Monday, like we get a bill in the mail like, no, Jesus, where'd you go? Right? Am I the only one? I'll be the only hypocrite in the room. That's cool. That's fine. No problem. All right. But Jesus was pretty cool to be around. Imagine everywhere you went, supernatural, amazing things like this would happen. That'd be crazy awesome. But take a look at the very first miracle Jesus ever performed. The very first one that Jesus ever performed, at least what we see in Scripture. Now, I don't know if Jesus performed miracles before this, but they weren't recorded. Okay? We know this is Jesus' first public miracle. All right, so in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, you with me? It'll be on the screen for you. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Just a heads up, not a wealthy neighborhood, okay? Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. Cool. 
When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. That's all she said. <laughs> right? How many, how many grew up where your mom could just give you a look and you, you had paragraphs of information? Yeah, right? If looks could kill, I'd have been dead years ago. <laughs> okay? right? you, you know the look. So, so all Mary did was give Jesus the look and say, <clears throat> And Jesus, oh man, Jesus says, what does that have to do with you and me, woman? Maybe he was saying, hey, hey, mom, mind your business, please. <laughs> right? Jesus, <laughs> well, Jesus asked, <clears throat> my hour has not yet come. So she completely ignores what Jesus just said and says, do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Did you notice that? Did you see Mary just straight up, like, ignore what Jesus said? <laughs> this is funny. Again, we read the Bible as holy Christians, and I think we only read the King James, and we forget that this is real. This is like, this was really, like, John was there. Right? The disciples were at the wedding. So John's at the wedding. John witnesses this conversation and is thinking, awkward, like, Jesus is God and he's arguing with his mom. How is this going to go? <laughs> right? And Mary just completely ignores Jesus saying, my hour has not yet come. And she looks at the servants and says, do what he tells you to do. Holy cow. <laughs> like, this is crazy. No, no one else. Like, I'm Italian. So I'm, I'm, I was used to this kind of environment growing up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just, just appreciate the moment. It's very funny. Now, before we continue, I just want to point something out from our message a few weeks ago. Who remembers when we talked about Jesus um, in the temple as a, as a teenager, when he was 12? All right, so go back and watch that. <coughs> Shameless plug. Go back and watch that at parkcenter.church backslash messages. All right. Anyways, um, when we talked about Jesus as a teenager, what we pointed out in that message was Jesus disagreed with his parents, but was submissive and obeyed them, right? They forget him at the temple. I mean, well, I'm sorry. They forget him in Jerusalem. They're searching everywhere. They finally find him at the temple. Mary, after her third heart attack, goes, why would you do this to me? And then what was Jesus' response? <laughs> Chill. Yeah, that's, that's the Vinny translation. That one didn't make the scriptures, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> no, he said, didn't you know I need to be about my father's business? Like, you knew this. Remember, Gabriel gave you a memo before I showed up in your womb? And he was like, yo, this dude's going to be God. And like, God's his father. Joseph is kind of like, you know, earthly father, but really good, like, you know what I'm prepping for, mom. Right? So, so instead of embarrassing her and correcting her or being disrespectful and insubordinate, first he lovingly gave her a reality check, respectfully. By the way, woman in this culture wasn't, woman, you call your mother woman today, you're going to lose all your teeth. Just a heads up, okay? Back then, you call your mother woman, it's like ma'am. It was a term of respect, endearment, okay? So don't, don't, don't call your mother woman. Won't end well for you. Okay, so so Jesus was not being disrespectful. He was actually being extra respectful while basically saying, "Hey, no, the, your your perspective is off here, right?" So Jesus lovingly corrected his parents, but instead of saying, "Nope, you go back home. I'm going to stay here," he obeyed them and submitted, even though they were in the wrong. We see this again, right here. And guess what? He's 30 years old. He's 30 years old, still obeying and honoring his mom. Isn't that interesting? I thought that was cool. He honors her. He calls her out, but then he obeys her, which, again, is, is crazy um, considering he's 30 years old. Very different culture than the American culture, right? Okay, awesome. Let's continue. John chapter 2. Let's continue the next verses, 6 through 11. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. 
So they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then after people are drunk, the inferior. You've kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Isn't that a great story? I love this story for just so many reasons, but so that I don't keep you here until five o'clock today, um, we're just going to focus on, on two points. That's been our theme with this series, right? So we're going to focus in on two points that I'd like to bring to you this morning. The first point is this, do your part by obeying Jesus, even if it doesn't make sense, right? Do your part by obeying Jesus, even if it doesn't make sense. Do your part by obeying Jesus, even if it doesn't make sense. Mary tells the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. First of all, who put Mary in charge? (laughs) Anybody wondering? It wasn't her wedding. It's not like she was, you know, mother of of the bride or mother of the groom. No? Anybody else wondering? Yeah, but news wasn't out yet. Like, Jesus is just another dude to them. Who put Mary in charge? Or or, or, here's another one. How did she know Jesus could or would do what he was about to do? He didn't go around healing people yet. This is the first one. How on earth, that was very presumptive of Mary, was it not? I mean, for all we know, maybe Jesus did this stuff around the house. No? I I mean, look, I I could see Joseph looking in the refrigerator and going, hey, Mary, we're out of orange juice. Mary says, okay, we'll go to ShopRite and get some next week. And then teenage Jesus being like, hey, Dad, pour yourself a glass of water. (laughs) (laughs) And then then Joseph does and starts drinking, and it's like freshly squeezed orange juice, right? I mean, look, either way, either way, Mary knew Jesus had the power to do something. Mary knew that Jesus had the, I, don't you just picture that scenario, isn't that great? Like Joseph drinking, drinking orange juice, that was water a second, sorry. All right. But, but, <laughs> but just, just keep this in mind. Mary didn't panic or, or abort mission, but she was confident in what Jesus could do. You, you, you know the family was freaking out. See, I'll tell you a little bit about, about Jewish culture at this time. A, a wedding wasn't four hours at the water mill. A wedding was like a week. Like, we partied like it's 1999. You feel me? It was like, <laughs> next day. <laughs> next day. <laughs> okay, it was just like, they, they partied for a long time. Why? Because family had, they, they didn't just book a flight. Family had to come and travel for days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, to get to all be in the same place. And we're not just going to have a quick four hours, throw you a check, and disappear. That's a very New York thing, <laughs> okay? At this time, you were there a long time. And so the expectation was that the family did enough planning so when it was time to pay for the wedding, there was enough catering for the entire length of the party if you ran out of wine look look any italians in the house oh man all right well that fell short uh (laughs) i did i did well i i I already know about the example that i'm all right anyways (laughs) you go to a party okay like where i don't know you go to a wedding right you you'd, you'd rather hear they ran out of food then the bar went empty, okay? In, in most cultures, especially of the day. The wine was very important. It was a very embarrassing thing if you ran out of wine at the wedding. Very embarrassing. Not good for the family. You feel me? Now, this was a social thing. 
It was a social disgrace. Nobody was going to die or be stoned or murdered or anything like that if you ran out of wine at a wedding. But socially, it was something that would be talked in, in, uh, by, by wash women for years. Oh, you remember her wedding? They ran out of wine. Unbelievable. Right? Like that. For years. For years. So Mary, trying to spare this person from embarrassment, came up with a plan, which was, hey, I know Jesus could handle this. I'm going to bring him in. Now, I know, I know, I know, I just told you that we were disappointed in Mary's response in that she didn't listen to Jesus when he said my time hadn't come yet. But can I just point something out for a second? If you were running that wedding and you knew you were out of wine, you're freaking out. 7-Eleven is not open. The liquor store is closed. And your guests are waiting. And you know what this is like if you have to go tell people you ran out of wine. Mary didn't freak out. Just, just hang with me. She didn't panic. She didn't freak out. But she was confident in what Jesus could do. How cool is that? Are we so confident in knowing who Jesus is that we're confident in what he could do? Or do we freak out when it looks like we're at the end of our rope, when we're at our wit's end? Now, let me be really clear. It is dangerous theology to think you have the ability to tell God what to do. There is a difference in what Jesus will do and what he can do. But rest assured, he loves you and will go above and beyond anything you can ever imagine. If it is for your good and for his glory. Make sense? Okay, so when life gets a little crazy, don't freak out. Remember, Jesus is at the wedding. All right. So Jesus tells the servants to go take this giant heavy water pitcher. I'm sorry, these these giant heavy water pitchers and fill them with water. The pitchers were made of stone, and they were already quite heavy, weighing anywhere from probably around 20 to 50 pounds, depending what they used by themselves, okay, for these giant jugs. So empty, they're probably anywhere from 20 to 50 pounds. So they carry these heavy stone jugs down to wherever there is a well for some fresh water, since they didn't have indoor plumbing. Keep in mind, this was not a wealthy family. We know this because they ran out of wine at the wedding. So they probably had to travel very far to get water. Only wealthy families could afford to have water close to their homes. You with me? You just trying to put some, some color on the black and white for you, okay? So the servants lug these 20 to 50 pound heavy jugs a long distance to fill them each with 30 gallons of water. One gallon of water weighs 8.3 pounds. Multiply that by 30, you get 249 pounds added to the weight of the jugs. So now you have anywhere from 270 to 300 pounds of weight in each of these jugs. Does this sound like an easy task? You with me? All right. (laughs) This was not an easy task. And if you're the servants, you are carrying... 300 pounds of water jug with water to do something some guy you never heard of named Jesus is telling you to do, and it seems ridiculous. It seems ridiculous. We're completely out of wine. This guy tells us to go make water. What? It just it doesn't make sense. You need grapes for wine, dude, and you need some time. Like, fine, hey, maybe, maybe this guy knows something we don't. Let's at least go get a bunch of grapes, and maybe he could expedite the process. But water? It's heavy, it's inconvenient, it's illogical, it's ridiculous. But they did just like he told them to do. They carried these giant heavy jugs all the way down to the well, filled them to the brim with water, yes, water, and then they carried these crazy heavy jugs all the way back, and then, without doing anything else... No magic wand, no abracadabra, right? He didn't, he didn't slip a little food coloring in there when no one was looking. Didn't even touch the stuff. All he did was tell them, okay, now go serve that water to the master of ceremonies. Go serve that water to the person who's in charge of the wedding who will disperse the meal to everyone because he's the first one that needs to taste this water. 
Do you think the servants at this point were afraid of humiliating themselves? Do you think they were afraid of, of offending the family and bringing even greater embarrassment? You know what's more embarrassing than running out of wine? <laughs> Handing out water <laughs> and calling it wine. <clears throat> no one's that drunk. You think it would go well for these servants if they served him water when he asked for more wine? Consider this. Consider this. Please, as you read your Bibles, always do your homework and dig deeper so you understand. Like, get into the scenario. Feel the emotions these people were feeling. It's real. This really happened. So they listen to this young man named Jesus. They pour the water into the master of ceremonies wine glass. And at some point, from the water jug to his lips, it turned into wine. <laughs> That's crazy. He didn't even touch it. He just told them to go pour it. Doesn't that just... Here's some interesting insights here I'd like us to consider this morning. Just like the servants in this story, we need to obey Jesus even when it makes absolutely no sense. He wants to use you to perform miracles too. Now, hold on. Before you leave thinking I'm crazy and one of those people that you read about on Facebook or TV and the preachers that, you know, here, buy some blessed miracle water for a hundred bucks and like, you know, no, that, that, we're not going there. That's, that's not where I'm going with this, all right? Don't, don't allow culture to speak into scripture. Allow scripture to speak into culture. Allow the scripture to speak for itself and to enlighten us as to what we need to see as truth. Stop using words that people have tainted and putting it onto the scriptures, okay? Allow the scripture to speak for itself. <clears throat> Jesus did not personally bring the wine to the master of the feast. He had the servants do it. Jesus wants to use you to perform miracles. And let me be really, really, really clear. Every time that you disciple somebody and that person goes from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive, a miracle took place. You didn't perform that miracle. He did it. All you did was obey and pour out the water. He's the one that turned it into wine. This is why it's so important that we value discipleship. This is why it's important that Christians can't just hide in holy huddles and be at church seven nights a week and then run away from the big bad world. We have to engage. We have to have relationships and disciple people who are far from God because that's literally where the miracle takes place. Look, your, your, your friends who have never heard of church or think church is where a bunch of wackos go, which is half true, we are kind of crazy, but, <laughs> but you know, they, they, they're not walking in here. It's not happening. The gospel they're going to hear and see, the Bible they're going to read, is you, is you, is you, is your life, is you opening your mouth, is you sharing your faith, is you giving your testimony, right? We even saw this true in Jesus' day, right? When, when Lazarus died and Jesus resurrected him, you, you know what I love about John chapter 12? John 11 tells the story. You know what I love about John chapter 12? In John chapter 12, the Pharisees went from only wanting to kill Jesus to wanting to kill Jesus and Lazarus. Because of Lazarus' testimony, many people came to believe in Jesus. So they wanted Lazarus dead again too. <laughs> How cool is that? Be a Lazarus. Let the fact that Christ has raised you from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive let that put a target on your back. Let them want you dead too because you won't shut up about what Jesus has done for you in your life. Now I gotta tell you, uh, getting back to the water into wine thing, it's, cool. it's a cool trick. It's a cool trick. If I were Jesus, I'd be so proud of this and I would want all the credit. Look what I did. It was H2O. Now it is delicious wine. You're welcome. Like that's, that's right? If, if I were Jesus, that's exactly, in, in fact, I'd, I'd bottle it. I'd tell them, guys, just go, go bottle water, put a label on there that says, la, la chaise Jesus, okay? And we're gonna sell this stuff and it's gonna make us tons of money because our profit margins are 100%. If I was Jesus. 
but not Jesus. He gives away all the credit. In the same way, think about this, he had the servants pour it. Jesus didn't go over to the master of ceremonies and go, <clears throat> I found some wine for you. No, he just hung in the background and let the servants bring it. In fact, who got the credit? Who got the credit? Servants. No, who got the credit? Mary. No, who got the credit? No, who got the credit? Who did the master of ceremonies call over? The groom. The groom got the credit. Great day for him. <laughs> Jesus has called you to deliver his message to the world. He calls you to go and make disciples. And all you have to offer is just ordinary water. It's Jesus working behind the scenes that makes ordinary water and turns it into something miraculous. He makes it wine, not us. But this requires us to obey doing the heavy lifting. Like I said, water jugs weighing 300 pounds. Long trip, not just from the kitchen, but from the outside well. <clears throat> it was hard work. The, the servants worked really hard that day. They did a lot of very, very, very heavy lifting by carrying the jugs and do, doing what seemed foolish at the time. But if they didn't obey, they would have missed the miracle. How many times do we think we have to outsmart God? God, here's the miracle I need, and I laid the plan out for you. You just got to sign here. I did it. Right? Instead of, God, teach me to rely on you and be responsible and live within my means. Instead, God, these are the lot of numbers I picked. Can you please make these ones pop up, please? God, I mapped this out perfectly. God, I need you to fix this relationship. I already went through several different conversations in my head with this person. This is the one I'm most comfortable with. I think this is the one I like. So I'm going to need you to conform this person so that it goes this way, okay? Just sign here, God. You control freaks. <laughs> I'm one too. I'm with you. I'd love that, right? Wouldn't that be great? But no, God's, God's actually like, um, I'm in control. There's going to be times this is going to make absolutely no sense to you. And by the way, if it starts to make sense, I'm going to shake it up a little bit and make it not make sense again because I'm the God you can't figure out. And I'm the God who wants all the glory and all the credit. Gideon, you got 10,000 men? Good job, buddy. I'm going to get rid of 9,700 of them. Just so you don't think you had anything to do with this. That's funny. But that's our God. That's how he operates. Jesus still performs miracles today. Every time a soul comes to life in Jesus Christ. But he calls us to obey him. We're not the miracle performers. We're just obeying him and bringing what Jesus did to others so they can taste and see. What has God called you to do lately? What has he placed before you divinely? Because there are no coincidences, right? There are no coincidences. Everything that has happened, he's been sovereign over. What has he placed before you divinely? Have you obeyed him? <clears throat> or have you used the excuse, that doesn't make any sense? Have you used that as an excuse to disobey him? And what I have found interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, I have met many a Christian who, when they say, that doesn't make any sense, that can't be what God meant, do you know how they present it? They present it like this. Well, Satan is the author of confusion. God's a God of order. So therefore, if this doesn't make sense to me, it must be from the enemy. It can't possibly be from God. <clears throat> do you see the twisted logic there? Do you see that? I hear this from pastors. <laughs> okay, this is, please, just stop. Stop and seek him and confirm what the Holy Spirit is calling you to do. But understand, if, it, if you don't have it all figured out, that doesn't mean that God isn't calling you to it. It means he's calling you to trust him and to obey him. You with me? We, we need to use wisdom, okay? It can't just be a free-for-all. 
But I promise you, I promise you, if you are seeking God, you're going to find him. You know how I can make that promise? He made that promise. He said, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. He's not hidden in some mysterious place that only people with a certain IQ can find him. He's there for all, accessible. Maybe God's called you to share the gospel with someone in the community or your workplace who you never would think to share it with. That person might be water that Jesus wants to turn into wine. There may be something miraculous that's taking place in their heart, and Jesus wants you to go deliver the message, Jonah. Go deliver the message, Jonah. Go deliver the message. My second point, and we'll close with this. Jesus is better than our best. Isn't that great news? Right? That's, that's great news, because... You know, I work really hard and, and I've got some skills in some areas and I'm really weak in other areas. And I am so happy to report that Jesus is way better than the best that I could ever bring to the table. The best that I could present. He is significantly better. We see in the story, after the master of the feast tasted this wine, he has an amazing response. He says here in John chapter 2, verse 10, everyone sets out the fine wine first, then... After people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. So Jesus, Jesus didn't like, like, you know, give some cheap wine to replace it. Jesus gave the best wine. He turned water into the best, I'm talking like $1,500 a bottle, wine. <laughs> what an incredible thing here. This Jewish family has provided their very best wine for their guests. They did. They did the best they could with the resources they had. They gave their very best wine for their guests to go out first, and then they moved on to the cheap box wine after running out of the good stuff. But they happened to run out of the cheap stuff too. Embarrassing for a family who invested so much into this wedding. Well, Mary knew the embarrassment this family would face, pulls in a favor from her son, who just so happens to be God wrapped in flesh, and Jesus obeys his mom and miraculously turns water into wine. But here's the remarkable part. It was the best wine. It was better, excuse me, it was better than the most expensive stuff that they spent their money on. That's crazy. They saved and worked hard for years to be able to get some wine that wasn't just the cheap stuff, to open up with something that people might go, oh, this is good. And the master of the feast, after he tastes the wine that Jesus turned water into, says compared to that, what they opened up with was the cheap box stuff. Isn't that just moving? Isn't that compelling? Now, now let me be really clear. The state of our heart is going to respond one of two ways to that. If we are humble, if we are contrite, if we are worshipers, if we are repentant, if we are God-fearers, we can say, amen, thank you, Jesus, that what you provide for me is better than anything I could possibly provide. But if we are religious and if we are arrogant then our response is like Saul. And our response is, how dare you show me up? I worked hard to provide that wine for this wedding. I worked hard and you, you, look, I appreciate you turning some water into wine, but you couldn't maybe match the level that I brought? Making me look bad, Jesus? Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Don't be the religious guy. Your works are nothing. Be thankful and grateful that Jesus provides better than the very best you ever could. Because as far as God the Father is concerned, your best isn't good enough to warrant eternity in heaven with Him. Because God expects perfection. And so you need to learn to be satisfied and grateful and thankful that Jesus is better than you because when he gave his best, this sacrifice was accepted by God because he was perfect. And because he, when he went into the grave, God the Father raised him to life as a sign of, yes, 
I accept this sacrifice. He was worthy because he was perfect. So you better start being thankful that Jesus is better than your best because your best warrants eternity in hell separated from God. And Jesus replaced your best with him. Let's check our hearts. Look, the same mentality and the same heart that brought you to a place of salvation, humility, realizing that Jesus is the only way, that humility needs to carry out in our lives. It can't end after that, right? The church, the church in, in Corinth did that, and Paul was like, guys, what are you doing? You started out with a grace mentality, and suddenly now it's going to turn into works? Like, who, where, this makes no sense to me, right? It, just, it doesn't make sense. How on earth would what started in faith as a work of God suddenly turn into works as a work of you? And then religious religion sets in. When Jesus calls us to obey him, we can rest assured the results won't just be good. They will be the best. But this doesn't mean it will be noticeably the best from our perspective every time. Where you're at in your life right now, God is completely sovereign over. The position that you're in, where you're at, the place you're at, God is sovereign over that. He's in control. He hasn't forgotten you. He's not wondering where you went. He knows where you're at. And he's still in control over that. Even if you can't see it. Even if you can't see it. He's working. Nothing is wasted. Now this, this doesn't mean it will be noticeably the best from your perspective every time. Consider this. Nowhere do we see that the servants, and, and by the way, culturally, culturally, the servants would never have gotten to taste that wine. Do you know that? Those servants in that situation, at that wedding, in that culture, almost certainly did not get to taste that wine. You see where I'm going with this? Prepare your hearts. The servants did not get to drink the very wine they served. They had no idea if it was the best wine or not. They just obeyed and they got to see the miracle take place that others got to enjoy that they themselves didn't. They did the heavy lifting. They carried 300 pounds of water down from the well all the way in and poured it for the master of ceremonies. They did the work. And they got to watch others enjoy it as they served them. Sometimes we get to enjoy the benefits of the miracles of God. But ultimately, the purpose of the miracles took place so that people would see and believe in Jesus. It's it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Jesus. It's not about you. I love, I love the thing Francis Chan, um, I know he's in trouble these days, so don't, don't shoot me. But uh, <laughs> Francis Chan, he tells this story of, uh, of someone who, who uh, when, when he used to pastor a mega church out in, in California, um, somebody went up to him after one of the services and said, you know, I, I, really, I really didn't enjoy worship today. And Francis said, oh, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. <laughs> it, right it's it's not about you it's not about me you know jesus really loves our crappy singing he does even when you got a little something in your throat and it, you know maybe you're a little flat or you know i'm not judging I, I didn't hear any i'm not accusing i'm just saying you might be going yeah i don't do the whole emotional karaoke thing with the words on the screen because uh, I'm not that great of a singer. That's okay. Jesus loves your crappy voice. He loves it. He loves those flat tones because of the heart behind it. He, he, he loves that. So even if you didn't enjoy worship, he really did. Sometimes we get to enjoy the benefits of the miracles. Ultimately, the purpose of the miracles that took place had nothing to do with the servants and everything to do 
with Jesus. Now, look at the end of the story. John chapter 2, verse 11 says this. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. See, we see the twofold purpose of Jesus' miracles here. The miracles were there to manifest his glory and get more disciples to believe in him. Not just this one, every one of Jesus' miracles. Jesus didn't raise Lazarus from the dead arbitrarily. Jesus didn't do anything arbitrarily. He didn't heal the sick. None of that stuff. In fact, in fact, Jesus even tells us that this is the point of the miracles. You remember the man born blind? Right? And, and the Pharisees are like walking around Jesus like, yeah, don't you be breaking our rules, Jesus. Right? As the crowds are following him. But they, they, they would keep trying to trick him. And then Jesus comes to this man who in the town, everybody knew this guy. He's, he's been the, the blind beggar here who was born this way. And then they try to trap him. Hey, hey Jesus, was this man born blind because of his sin or because of his mother's sin? Jesus. Let's talk theology, Jesus. We're going to stump you. You remember what Jesus said? He was born this way that the glory of God may be revealed in him. Wow. Now, if I'm that guy, I'm like a little, wait a second. So the last X amount of years I've been alive, I was blind just because of this moment? Like, what? <laughs> But yeah, that's right. You were born blind, lived the life that you did because there is a greater purpose than your pleasure or your happiness. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the glory of God. If, if that means I gotta suffer, if it means I gotta go through pain, if it means I gotta go through hurts, if it means I gotta go through betrayal, if it means I gotta go alone, whatever it is, if God is glorified in it, Amen. Let it be. That was the point of the miracles. So that God's glory would be revealed. Jesus' glory in that moment would be revealed publicly. And the result was more people believed in him. And you thought your miracles were all about you passing a test and winning the lotto. No. No. If, if it's not worth God's glory, don't wait for that miracle. It's not happening. And I'll tell you what turns my stomach. You, you, know what, you, what, you know what makes headline news? When some idiot prophet from, I forgot what country he's from, comes out and says, God told me that Kobe Bryant and his daughter's death was not ordained by God and for $50 million, I will resurrect them from the dead. Google it. I'm not making this up. Look it up. The audacity. That's for your own glory, first of all. And second of all, $50 million? Really? Really? See, that... Mm, oh... <laughs> I wish I had some tables to turn. Like, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous, and it's self-serving, and it's ugly, and it's got nothing to do with God's glory, and it has everything to do with his own glory. We need to live out our lives as obedient servants of Jesus, no matter what he calls us to do. And let us remember, what Jesus brings to the table is better than our best efforts. We need to bow and recognize it is all about him. It is all about his glory. It is all about them believing in him. I don't care what they think of me. I care what they think of him. We must all live our lives that way. Every one of us. Every one of us. In the process, miracles will take place in people's hearts. Some that we get to witness ourselves, some that we won't see until we get to heaven. However, the story and the glory is ultimately about and for Jesus. Jesus. The God-man whose life would be the greatest scandal. 
What's more scandalous than opening up your public miracle ministry, not by raising the dead or healing the sick, but by turning water into wine just to keep a party going? It's just starting to get good. So join us next week as we continue in the scandal. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I can't even begin to pretend that I understand you. (laughs) I went to school for this stuff. (laughs) You are overwhelming. You are greater than our greatest God. We are sorry that we question your ways when things don't make sense to us. Forgive us for the audacity and for the arrogance. Forgive us for the foolishness when we think that we have it figured out and that we need to teach you. But God, let us be humble servants. Let us learn what you're trying to teach us. God, let us serve others even when it doesn't make sense. And let us be happy when they reap the benefits of the, of the, of the fruit, even if we don't get to taste the wine ourselves, God. God, let us be broken more and more each day of our pride. Less of us, more of you. Less of us and more of you. And Lord, I believe, I believe that if we honor you and live that way and obey you, that the world can change. God, I pray for your church. I pray that she would wake up. I pray that she would stop following false leaders that tickle their ears. My God, she would repent. God, that we would hit our knees again, that we would be led by you again, that we would stop treating it like a business and remember that you created a family. God, I pray that we would stop acting like victims and playing the defensive, but you said the gates of hell would not be able to stop your church And gates are for defense. That means your church is supposed to be on the offensive, God. So I ask you, Lord, forgive us of our sin and for the idols that we've allowed into your house. Give us the wisdom and the courage to tear them down, to focus on you, and to be the church you've called us to be for your honor, for your glory, not for our legacy, Lord, but Jesus, for yours. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.